Thank you for tuning in to the Student Organization Summit. Make sure to follow us on social media and check out the many other videos on this channel about working with and advising student organizations. And now, please enjoy your workshop. Hello, everyone, and welcome to So What's the Sitch? Situational Advising 101. My name is Colin Fitzpatrick, and I am the Assistant Director of Student Life for Fraternity and Sorority Life at Ball State University. To just give some insight into Ball State University, a general institutional overview is we're located in Muncie, Indiana, um, a lot of corn and a lot of, not a lot of things around the university. Um, we're a part of the Mid-American Conference, otherwise known as the MAC. Ball State is considered a predominantly white institution or a PWI. There is over 22,000 students at Ball State University in combination of undergraduate and those that are pursuing higher degrees. The institution currently has a 62% acceptance rate and we have over 400 student organizations on our campus. So what is this about? Truly, we want, I want to create and help you have a better understanding of the role of a student leader and of an advisor. So this is gonna be really helpful for those who are considering going into the field of student affairs, those are who are graduate assistants and those who are in their first time advising roles um, professionally. Um, to help give you a better understanding of what an advisor role should be, how this knowledge impacts your work as an advisor, general understanding of situational advising, so theory to practice, real life experiences and how to apply them, and then general advising advice. So first, I'm going to need you to brainstorm some things to kind of help get a better understanding um, and so you can reflect on some questions I have for you. So I'm going to give you two minutes to brainstorm what are the qualities of a great student leader. One more minute to brainstorm, write down some of the qualities that make a great student leader. All right, now I want you to take a moment and now brainstorm some of the qualities of a great advisor. So think of some great advisors that you may have had in your undergraduate experience from working with student organizations, um, a hall director when you were a resident advisor or an orientation leader. So take about two minutes and write some of those down.
Got about in one more minute. Go ahead and kind of wrap up your thoughts. Some of those qualities that make a great advisor. All right, so, perfect, okay. So in having discussions and gathering some thoughts from graduate assistants and other students and um, at Ball State, we, we, to discuss what are some of the similar, qual similar qualities that an advisor and a great student leader shares. So think of, look at your list and see what things kind of compare or overlap between the two. Many of the things that I'm putting on the screen here are things that were said and shared that each role shares. They're goal-oriented, positive, hardworking, responsible, honest, strong communicator, dedicated, encouraging, open-minded, and knowledgeable. But one of the most important things is, yes, there's a lot of overlap in what these positions or what these types of individuals do, but the most important thing are what are the differences between each of these roles? So go ahead and look at your sheets or your list that you created and think about what are the differences between each of those roles? One may have more knowledge of a certain subject than the other. One may be a mentor to the other or there are mentorship opportunities available to one and not the other. You, they, one can be a teacher and an educator. Um, an advisor is a university policy risk agent. Advisors may have higher skill or competency levels. And advisors are traditionally employed by the institution. So somebody that works in student life or um, in an area of student affairs. And also still learning. Student leaders are still learning. As student affairs professionals, yes, we're still learning, but we've had our time in our master's programs and our undergraduate degrees, or some of us with even a couple of years of full-time experience under our belt, where we have a, um, I guess, more learning experiences or understanding of things than a student leader may. So why is understanding the similarities and the differences in these roles so important in your work of being an advisor? Well, I'll tell you. That's where we get to situational advising. So you need to understand your role as an advisor in order to advise students. You have to have a solid self-awareness and strength of understanding of what your role is in that advisor-student leader relationship in order to perform to the best of your ability, make sure students successful, make sure that they're growing and developing and learning. So what is an advisor? An advisor is somebody with a deeper knowledge of a specific area, someone who has more experience in a specific area, and by specific area, I mean like a functional area or an understanding. And they also have cross-functional and multidisciplinary experiences. Student leaders that are involved in student organizations or certain areas of campus that are potentially like siloed in a certain area, such as fraternity and sorority life or multicultural student organizations, whereas student life and other advisors have a lot of cross-functional and multidisciplinary understandings of multiple different areas of student affairs within or on their campus, um, multiple different student organizations, past leadership or volunteer roles that they've had or other potential like facilitation experiences. An advisor acts as a mentor and a guide to student leaders. They help develop students as individuals and as a leader. They promote organizational and operational growth of or student organizations. And they always, always, always put the interests of the student above their own. 
So next, I'm going to kind of shift into the situational leadership model. So I'm going to explain how this model works and how then this can combine to become a situational advising and a way for you to utilize this theory and this model and this understanding and onto your general work. So for situational leadership, think of students as a different level of competency in ability and willingness. So think of willingness as coachability, somebody who is eager, willing to learn, willing to take on new responsibilities, try new things, whereas ability is the actual physical ability or a potential strength in leadership skills, administrative abilities, facilitating conversations, just general leadership qualities that you would find in somebody who is a strong leader. So Kenneth Blanchard and Paul Hersey kind of created this situational leadership model where students are in four different levels of progression. So students in this D1, which is this first area um, of uh, situational leadership based on their combination of their willingness and their ability. So students who are in this area may be very new leaders or young leaders or individuals forced into their first ever leadership role. They might not necessarily be very eager or excited to be in this position or they're in it because no one else would take it on and somebody encouraged them to be in it. Or it's a requirement that they have to fulfill in order to um, obtain a leadership minor or something within their program or they have a, just a lower leadership ability. They haven't had many experiences um, or ways in order to build those leadership competencies or increase their ability as a leader. And then slowly moving from that D1 phase, D2 to D3 to D4, where D4 is our extraordinary competent student leader, our folks who have a really high willingness to participate and engage and take on responsibilities and fulfill responsibilities. They keep their promises. They love attending those one-on-one -on -one meetings with you. They take advice. They're, they're ready to move on to the next step post-graduation and they're a fully realized developed leader. As well as they've worked on and had experience, experiences in order to build their skill set um, to where they have a higher functioning ability um, to be a leader in a lot of different situations. So again, think about students as kind of like a co uh, combination of willingness and ability. So you'll be able to kind of assess individual student leaders throughout working with them and understanding that who on the, you know, say you are working with the Black Student Association Executive Board, and you have an individual who is incredibly willing to learn, but doesn't necessarily have some of the, the leadership skill set or competencies needed in order to be a strong or fully realized leader. So they may be more in like the D2 or D3 um, realm of leadership. Next, thinking of leadership uh, another part of this leadership model is influencing behaviors and advising style. So think about each of these as you are in the situation of being an advisor and working with a student. And these are the four influencing behaviors um, that you can utilize in order to assist students in certain aspects of their leadership development and their competencies. So in S1, for is what is called directing. So this is where there's a really high directive from the advisor with low support. So you're not necessarily asking the student to do much on their own. They're not really sure where to go, what to do. This may be their first time in a student organization or taking on any sort of responsibility outside of maybe like their home or their schoolwork. So there's gonna be a high level of directing um, to where you're providing that directive to the student of um, some higher level 
oversight or giving them to-do lists or what to do next or a list of things they need to accomplish. And this is something that would definitely be in these kind of um, coincide. So S1 would coincide with D1. So that may be potential low willingness or low ability level. Um, so this is where students will need that additional direction in order to be able to be a successful student leader or to understand more about their position or themselves as a leader. Next is the S2, which is coaching. So coaching is something that our, my staff at Ball State University for our fraternity and sorority life staff utilizes regularly. So we provide coaching opportunities to our fraternities and sororities and our council executive board leaders. So we're providing high directive and high support to the students. We are encouraging them in their endeavors to try new things, to learn, to grow, um, and also providing them a high level of directive of, well, you need to understand this policy or here's this information or I can help you do this. So this is a very regular and interactive influencing behavior um, that can be utilized with students who are in a range um, of willingness and uh, competency level or ability level. Um, but this is definitely an area that is important to kind of push people to that next level of um, leadership development or personal development. So the next influencing behavior is supporting or that F3 area. It's where you are more or less just available to provide support to students. So this is when student leaders are really starting to kind of springboard into that leadership um, potentially their leadership role or have a little bit more experience or are very, very willing to do a lot of things. Um, so this is where you just provide them with resources with, um, you are there and you're available for them to bounce ideas off of, to meet every once in a while to assist them in their, their thoughts or what's next, rather than telling them what to do um, or pointing them in the direction they need to go. They know their direction. They just need your support in order to get there. So think of um, themselves, the student as a bowling ball being rolled down the bowling alley and the advisor is um, the bumpers. So we're there to provide that support to make sure they get to the end goal. And lastly is delegating. Delegating is an influencing behavior slash an advising style that can be used for student leaders who are incredibly willing and incredibly competent in their work as a leader and in their leadership roles in their student organizations. Uh, these are students who kind of need our help, um, but they definitely don't need the directive or the support that other student leaders do. So think of these as seasoned student leaders who are potentially in their senior year or they're the president of a very prestigious honor society on campus, or um, they're very active in their major and other different areas of campus and have a lot of um, intense experiences that other student leaders may not have. Um, so these are the students that uh, may not necessarily need as much of your time and attention, um, but are definitely prevalent for those who work with a lot of executive boards that have student leaders who are kind of at the end of their collegiate journey. So how do we take the concepts of the situational leadership model of willingness and ability level of our students and the influencing behaviors and advising styles of us as advisors and combine them into an effective practice in order for us to push students to learn, grow, develop, become their best selves, realize their potential? Well, I'll tell you. So with theory to practice, you need to identify the most important aspects and priorities of that student you are working with or the student organization or both. So making sure that your understanding of those priorities is very important. You need to be able to diagnose where they're at as a student with their performance readiness or developmental level. So what is their willingness to perform, their willingness to complete tasks, go above and beyond, and then what is their general developmental level and ability? Then once you're able to diagnose that, you can match one of those influencing behaviors or advising styles that you can call them to 
create that max, maximum effectiveness and results in your advising. So utilizing that directing, coaching, supporting, or delegating in order to assist students based on where they're at um, and or where you are able to diagnose them at and their performance readiness and developmental level. So with directing, a student that has a low ability and a low willingness the advisor should utilize that directing approach with a high directive and not as much support, more direction. If a student has low ability and a high willingness, so they might not necessarily have the skills needed, but they're ready to go, they're ready to learn, ready to do the work, you can coach them. You can give them that high amount of directive and support in order to encourage them um, to develop and grow and reach that next level of um, competency or ability. With students that have a high ability and maybe a low willingness, so they could be very talented leaders, they just might not care or might not be as interested in the position that they hold or were forced into a position, um, that supporting role is going to be very important. Um, you may, you were going to be giving them low directive but high support. You may at some points be that student's counselor or a listening ear or providing them with resources or ideas in order to kind of spark their leadership and get them to be more excited about their position. And lastly, if a student has that general high ability and leadership competency and a high willingness to do the work, as an advisor, you're in a delegating state of giving low directive as well as just providing low support or support as needed for students. So here's some general advice that I've learned over the years of advising, my past three years of advising student organizations, specifically fraternities and sororities uh, and other organizations like Dance Marathon. There's a really great ways to kind of help inform your advising practices. So first, creating boundaries. These should be healthy and professional. You should not be available to be texting students at one o'clock in the morning when they have a question. There are some things that can just wait till the next day when you're in the office. Or talking about personal conversations or relationship things that you might not necessarily need to be involved in. Next is transparency. So being transparent with students and sharing information with them when it's necessary and when it's appropriate. Students don't need to know everything that's happening in your job or in your personal life or other general information pieces, or sometimes you need to push them to find the answer themselves. But when it's necessary, you should be sharing information that is um, pivotal to their general success for um, their development, an event that they're hosting, or a strategy for the organization that you're working with. Next, communication. Keep it professional. Utilize things like email, Slack, and Teams. Try your best to stay away from, unless this is a personal preference, from giving out your personal cell phone number, um, from sharing your social media or different pieces of your personal life. Try to keep these conversations or things in one or a few um, professional spaces in order to make sure that information that's shared is in that singular space. Um, and I've seen a, this can go either way in a very positive direction um, or it can go in a negative direction if you choose to have too many communication mediums. Next is building rapport with students. You need to develop a trusting relationship. That's key. If a student doesn't trust you, they're not going to share information with you. They're not going to come to you in their time of need or when they want your assistance. Uh, so you need to be able to be authentic with them, professional and have their, show them that you have their best interest in succeeding. Next, don't do it for them. Don't do it for them. They're never going to learn or grow or develop any competencies if you do it for them. Like I mentioned before, as advisors, we're like the bumpers on a bowling alley. We're not rolling the ball and we're not the ball ourselves. We're just there to kind of guide them and support them and provide them with the sum directive as needed in order for them to achieve that end result. Next, you need to find balance. You may have a pretty immense amount of student organizations that you work with or a lot of student leaders that you're expected to sh uh, share your time with. 
you need to be able to divide your time between all of the students and all the organizations that you work with. So make sure that you're putting specific times on your calendar and holding those times sacred for students in order to make sure they're receiving the level of support that you should be giving them and that they deserve. Next, do not play favorites. This becomes so obvious to students and students can become very disinterested to uh, fulfill the duties and responsibilities of their position if you are playing favorites with other members of that organization. Um, this could come in the form of um, buying coffee for a student or regularly only having conversations with a few students or some students might have your cell phone numbers where others don't. Um, I definitely recommend an all or none approach. Try and treat everyone equally and with the same level of respect and dignity that you would treat any other student. Next is time management. You have to understand that as an advisor, different student groups are gonna need different levels of your time and support at different times of the year. Just like I know with working in fraternity and sorority life that our inner fraternity council and our Panhellenic Association are gonna need a lot of my assistance when it comes to the first few weeks of school when there is that huge uh, recruitment mentality of managing the formal recruitment process or hosting and advertising and um, getting students to sign up and interested in joining a fraternity or sorority and within those councils. That's incredibly important. But then I also know when it hits the early, the late fall and early spring semester, that dance marathon is gonna need a ton of my time and attention because they're counting down the days until their actual dance marathon event. So knowing when those types of busy seasons are for different groups is also really important. A lot of times you'll learn that within your first year of your graduate assistantship or in your first year as a full-time professional. And I'm gonna say this again, don't do it for them. I say it twice because it's so, so important. In some situations, I do understand it's necessary, um, whereas maybe you're advising a programming board and there is a traditional event that happens during homecoming, uh, but the folks who are in charge of it that are the student leaders aren't necessarily fulfilling their duties and responsibilities, and those are events that are expected to happen and need to happen, that is when you potentially need to step in and be able to do some things for them and for the greater good of other students on campus but that's not gonna assist in the growth and development of those specific student leaders if you do it for them. Another important piece of advice is stay updated. You need to be aware of national trends, national policies, legal information, state, local, federal laws. All of these things are so important, especially in living in a current virtual space and in a pandemic with guidelines from the Center for Disease Control or with different institutions, different cities, states or areas having different expectations or rules or executive orders where it comes to COVID policies. This is so important for students to understand and for you to help them understand and for you to understand in general because you won't be able to perform as an advisor and provide them with the correct direction or support that they would need in order to host a safe event or have that same developmental impact on folks who attend those students events. Next, it's important to ask guiding questions. Don't just give them the answer. Help the students reflect, help them explore, and help them try to figure out things on their own. Maybe kind of pointing them in the direction that they need to go in order to find out how to safely do this, or what is the maximum number of people that are allowed at a, a certain venue. Um, so making sure that you are asking those guiding questions to kind of push them and open-ended um, as well. Schedule management. This is incredibly important. I treat my calendar like it is my child. I give it so much time and attention because I always am planning ahead for that next meeting, that next event, planning out times on my calendar when I need to work on projects or be present for a student organization's event. Planning your schedule is so incredibly important. So making sure that you're always having your calendar up to date, sharing it with necessary people that you either are colleagues in the same office, other areas of the institution that you regularly work with, or sometimes student leaders who need a lot of your general support need access to your calendar or when you're free. Next, you gotta embrace the awkward and embrace the difficult. Sometimes conflict is your best friend. 
so much learning can come from conflict, especially between students on an executive board. I've had so many times in my career with students that have had issues with each other or issues with how an event went, went or students who weren't being held accountable to completing their duties and responsibilities. And 99% of the time, the conversations that are had with an advisor's assistant with figuring out and identifying the issue, what are potential root causes or things that are getting in the way of that student doing their job to the best of their ability. And there's a lot of learning that can come forward from that and how those students can now work together and we can create a better accountability plan moving forward. And then also you gotta remember who you're working with. Yes, you might be working with regularly working with very competent student leaders or young freshman leaders if you're in a first year experience program, but also you have to understand that all of the people that you're working with, they are a person first. Then they're a student and then they're a leader. If they're not completing their responsibilities as a leader or within a position that you, in an organization that you advise, you have to understand that they just might be incredibly busy as in their student life, where that is they might have a ton of exams around that midterm point of time, or depending on their major, they may just have a lot of different projects and things going on at once. And then there's also the combination of things that are going on in their personal life, their relationships, their family, their friends, or even a potential job that they may hold. So you have to understand that students have so many overlapping identities that sometimes you just need to have grace and understanding that although advising may be your full-time job and your priority, that student group that you're working with might not be that student leader's priority all the time. Awesome. Well, if anyone has any questions or anything about my presentation or is looking for any additional advice or understanding or how to better apply um, the social, uh, the leadership model, um, the situational leadership model, or how to combine those different pieces into your advising methods with working with students, um, feel free to reach out to me via email, or you can reach out to me on Instagram. Um, and I will also be, of course, throughout this presentation, I would, will be present answering questions and things in the chat. Um, but if there's additional questions or things, or if you want more information or where this research comes from, I would be happy to share that with you. Thanks for tuning in to the Student Organization Summit. If you're watching this live, feel free to reference the schedule for the day and use the link in the schedule to access a Q&A room where you can ask questions or chat with the presenters from this workshop. If they didn't list a Q&A link or you're watching this video after the event, thank you for your interest in the Student Organization Summit.